Chapter 14 Eileen Wanos's Confession In Her Own Words Tyra Moore was located on Thursday the 10th of January by Major Dan Henry of Marion County Sheriff's Department. She had fled her parents' home and was living with her sister in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Once he had cleared any jurisdictional matters with the local police, Major Henry did something quite remarkable for a senior officer investigating a serial murder case. He booked into a local motel with one of his prime suspects, Tyra, and then he summoned Jerry Thompson of Citrus County and Bruce Munster of Marion County, who flew to Scranton to interview her. In her possession were, among other things, a briefcase and clock radio identified as the property of Charles Humphreys, and other items the property of Curtis Corky Reed. In that motel room Tyra was informed of her rights, but not charged with any offence or granted immunity. There was no plea bargain deal either. Munster says he made sure she knew what perjury was, swore her in, and sat back as she gave her statement. Within a short while she agreed to testify against Lee at trial, and she was involved with Munster, Henry, and Vinegar to sell her story for a television movie. Our three cops, having access to the entire investigation papers, would act as consultants. Initially, Tyra told the police that she had sort of known about the Mallory murder since Lee had arrived home with Richard Mallory's Cadillac. Lee had openly confessed that she had killed a man that day, but Tyra had advised Lee not to say anything else. I told her I don't want to hear about it, she told detectives. And then, at any time, she would come home after that and say certain things, telling me about where she got something. I'd say I don't want to hear it. Tyra had her suspicions, she admitted but wanted to know as little as possible about Lee's business. The more she knew, she reasoned, the more compelled she would feel to report Lee to the authorities. She did not want to do that. I was just scared, she said, bursting into tears. She always said she'd never hurt me, but then you can't believe her, so I don't know what she would have done. The next day, Tyra accompanied Munster and Thompson on their return to Florida to assist in the investigation. A confession from Lee would make the case virtually airtight, and Munster and Thompson explained their plan to Tyra on the flight. Putting her under twenty-four-hour surveillance, they would register her into a Daytona motel and have her make contact with Lee in jail, explaining that she had received money from her mother and had returned to collect the rest of her things. Their conversations would be taped. She was to tell Lee that the authorities had been questioning her family and that she thought the Florida murders would be mistakenly pinned on her. Munster and Thompson hoped that, out of loyalty to Tyra, Lee would confess. Lee was aware, though, that the phone she was using was being monitored, and made efforts to speak of the crimes in code words, and to construct alibis. The calls continued for three days. Tyra became even more insistent that the police were after her, and it became clear that Lee knew what was expected of her. She even voiced suspicion that Tyra was not alone, that someone was taping their conversations. But as time passed, she became less careful about what she said. She would not let Tyra go down with her. Just go ahead and let them know what you need to know, what they want to know, or anything, she said, and I will cover for you, because you are innocent. I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen, if I have to confess, I will. Over the three days there were eleven conversations, some of which follow in abridged form. Operator. We have a call to room 160 from Lee. Moore. Ah, uh, yes, go ahead. Wanos. Hey, Ty. Moore. Yeah. Wanos. What are you doing? Moore. Nothing. What the hell are you doing? Wanos. Nothing. I'm sitting here in jail. More. Yeah, that's what I heard. Wanos. How... What are you doing down here? More. I came down to see what the hell is happening. Wanos. Everything's copacetic. I'm in here for a... a, vi a con... carrying a concealed weapon back in 86, and a traffic ticket. More. Really? Wanos. Uh-huh. More. Because there's been officials up at my parents' house asking some questions. Wanos. Uh-oh. 
more, and I'm getting scared. Wanos. Hmm. Well, you know, I don't think there should be anything to worry about. More. Well, I'm pretty damn worried. Wanos. I'm not going to let you get in trouble. More. That's good. Wanos. But I tell you what. I would die for you. More. Would you? Wanos. Yes, I would. That's the truth. I'll gladly die for you. And I'll just wait and see you on the other side. But you didn't do anything. Are you really by yourself? More. Yes, I am. Wanos. Oh, I'm so proud you work in a factory. What do you make? More. Buckets. Wanos. Is it... Is it boring? More. Time goes by pretty fast. Four dollars fifty-five. Wanos. Oh, that's cool. Good. I'm so happy for you. When I get this cleared out, I can't wait to get out of here and get me another job and everything. More. I know. Wanos. It is really mistaken identity. I'm telling you it is. I know it is. And I know it's one of those girls or somebody at work must have said. Hey, those look like... That looks like Lee and Ty and everything else, you know. God, Ty, I miss you so much. We couldn't pay the rent no more and everything. We had to go. That you had... It would... It was best for you to go back up and get... Because I knew. I told you if you go up and you'd find a job in a heartbeat. And I was thinking about going getting up there, but I said... Shit, it's snowing and stuff, and there's no sense in me going up there in the snow and everything when I didn't really have any real good, you know, help or anything like that. More. They're coming after me, I know they are. Wanos. No, they're not, how do you know that? More. They've got to, why are they asking so many questions then? Wanos. Honey, listen, do what you've got to do, okay? More. I'm going to have to, because I'm not going to jail for something that you did. This isn't fair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mum has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell is going on. Wanos. I... Listen, you didn't do anything and I'm... I will definitely let them know that, okay? More. You evidently don't love me any more. You don't trust me or anything. I mean, you're going to let me get in trouble for something I didn't do. Wanos. Tyra, I said I'm not. Listen, quit crying and listen. More. I can't help it. I'm scared shitless. Monos. I love you. I really do. I love you a lot. More. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... Monos. I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen. If I have to confess, I will. More. Lee, why in hell did you do this? Monos. I don't know. Listen, did you come down here to talk to some detectives? More. No, I came down here by myself. Just why in the hell did you do it? Wanos. Ty, listen to me. I don't know what to say, but all I can say is self-defense. Don't worry. They'll find out it was a solo person, and I'll just tell them that, okay? More. Okay. Wanos. And you'll be scot-free. You didn't do anything. All you did was work, eat, and sleep. You were never around. More. But, Lee, I knew for a year about the first one. At least, I mean, that's a hell of a long time. Wanus. I don't know. I think that you didn't know. I think I pretty much left you out of that. More. No, you didn't. You came right out and told me about that one, and then I saw it on the news. Wanus. Ty, what do you want to do? Go to prison? Tell them everything. Although, it... I told you everything just before you left. You were thinking about turning me in. More. When you did it the first time, I should have said something and... Wanos. Well, you were confused and scared, Ty. More. I know I was. Wanos. You're not the one and I'm not going to let you go down on something you didn't do. I love you too much to do that. I love you more than... I love you right next to God. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. More. What? Wanos. When I die, my spirit's going to follow you, and I'm going to keep you out of trouble, and shit, and if you get in an accident, I'll save your life and everything else. I'll be watching you. I promise.
probably won't live long, but I don't care. Hey, by the way, I'm going to go down in history. More. What a way to go down in history. Wanus. No, I'm just saying, if I ever write a book, I'm going to have... Give you the money. I don't know, I just... Let me tell you why I did it, all right? More. Hmm? Wanos. Because I'm so... Fucking in love with you, that I was so worried about us not having an apartment and shit. I was scared that we were going to lose our place, believing that we wouldn't be together. I know it sounds crazy, but it's the truth. I just hope you find somebody that loves you as much as I do. I don't want you to live alone all the rest of your life. You're a good person. More. After you, I may live by myself for the rest of my life. Wanos. Ty, I don't want them messing with you. You go first, and then I'll tell them, okay? I'd rather have you with your parents. All righty? I just wish... I never went... met Tony. Because Tony turned me into a lesbian. Then I fucked up because I... See, when I have somebody, I love them all the way, and I love them with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. And I'll do anything. I go nuts. More. You turned me against everybody. I won't trust a person for the rest of my life. Wanos. I love you very much. More. I know that. Wanos. Will you get over me? More. Yeah, I don't think it'll be any problem at all. Wanos. Okay. I'm sorry. I know this hurts. It is hurting you a lot. It hurts me because I don't have a family and I'm thinking about you. And you got a family. I know, I wish I had you so I could hold you and hug you and kiss you and tell you how much I'm sorry. Here is a kiss. Okay, I'm going to eventually confess. What time do you check out? There's a tap on the phone. More. Eleven. Really? Wanos. Yep. More. I didn't even hear it. Wanos. I heard a little tick. More. Well, I'm getting ready to leave, so if you want to go ahead and get it over with, go for it. I was sure it was being taped, Lee said later. The way she was talking, I felt it. The way she was able to come back to Florida so quickly. She was staying in a motel for fifty dollars a night. Where'd she get fifty dollars a night? But she kept crying. They're going to destroy me. I might as well kill myself. I need you to talk to the cops so they'll leave me alone. So I went and told the police that she had nothing to do with the crimes. But I also told them thirty-seven times that it was in self-defense. Lee did have one friend at Volusia County Branch Jail. Marjorie Bertolani was a jail officer who befriended Lee. In her depositions, she recalled the conversations she had with her. What did she inform you? I told my corporal, you know, that Miss Warnos wanted to speak to me. She looked really upset. So Corporal Cresta let me inside the block. When I got to the Sally Port, she had gone to the telephone. She signalled for me to come in. I went over to a couple of other girls that were by a table. Miss Wanos was on the telephone. She was very upset. I was going to go ahead and leave again, and Miss Wanos got off the phone and signalled for me to come over to the table. And I sat down with her at the day room table. She was sobbing. She was very, very upset. She asked me if I... She said she had done something terrible, and she wanted to get something off her chest. She asked me if I was a Christian. I told her yes, I was. She proceeded to tell me that she had done some bad things, and she was one of the people that was wanted on these murders. And I just kind of... I really didn't know much about the case. I knew she was our mystery guest, you know, we just treat them like anybody else. She told me she had this lover named Tessie. She had nothing to do with the murders. And they had gotten drunk one night, and she had said something to this girl, and that she wanted to confess. And I asked her if she had an attorney. She said, No. I said, Well, I suggest you get yourself one. I told her, You know anything that you said to me, I have to tell my superiors. She said, Well, I wanted to get it off my chest and she would speak to anybody, investigators, police, anybody. She said she wanted to go to heaven. 
She was afraid she wouldn't go to heaven. That's why she was telling me. That's why she wanted to confess to someone. What shifts were you working that day? Eight to four shift. This occurred at what time? This was about ten o'clock. In the morning? Yes, sir. Had she, to your knowledge, up to that point, been pulled from her cell and taken to any other area of the jail? You mean like to be questioned or something? Yes. No, not at all. Nobody bothered her at all. Was she, to your knowledge, taken later that day? Yes, she was. The block that she was in, they have a telephone inside that area? Yes, they do. And they can make collect calls out of there? Yes, sir. She was trying to get hold of this Tessie. I don't believe she got hold of her that day. She was really upset. I don't know who else she had called. You're saying she was visibly upset. Was she crying? Yes, she was sobbing. For longer than a brief moment. For the whole time I was at the table she was. She asked me what I would do. I said, I'd ask for forgiveness. You know, I'd forgive myself because she was really very, very upset. Of course, anybody that upset we really watch for suicidal tendencies. Her emotional state was enough to at least concern you. Yes, it was. She told me that she had killed six, not ten. Where did the figure ten come from? I had no idea, sir. She said, I killed six, I did not kill ten. Did you at any point in time during that contact with her? You're familiar with Miranda warnings? Yes, sir, I just told her that she had the right to counsel before she even, you know, after she had said. I said, well, you should have an attorney. You should be telling this to an attorney. She said she wanted to get it off her chest and she would talk to anyone. She said, I'll talk to investigators. I'll talk to detectives. I want to get it off my chest. I want to go to heaven. She kept crying. Did she describe any conversations she may have had recently with this Tessie? Only that she loved her very much and that she was a Christian and goes to church a lot and had nothing to do with it and really hated to see her go through this and she'd probably never talk to me again. Her words. In talking about this situation, wanting to talk to someone based on what she was telling you, why did she seem to want to get this off her chest? because she said she was a Christian. She said she had really studied the Bible before. She wanted to go to heaven. She was afraid she was not going to heaven. She said they were going to give her the electric chair. Did she mention anything about wanting to protect this Tessie? No, she said she had nothing to do with it. She had told her about something in one of those episodes that she had had. She was drunk, in a drunken state, and she had confessed this. And Tessie really didn't know anything about it. Did it seem important to her to want to make sure people knew that Tessie didn't have anything to do with it? Not really. It was more like she wanted to go to heaven. She was more worried about that. Shortly after 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of January, 1992, Lee met investigators Lawrence Orzeppa of Volusia County and Bruce Munster of Marion County. Her interview was both video and audio recorded. Her love for Tyra was such that she had to clear her lover's name. If she did confess, maybe she would go to heaven. Lee was appointed two Volusia County Assistant Public Defenders, Raymond Cass and Donald Jacobson. But it was in the presence of Assistant Public Defender Michael O'Neill that she confessed to the murders of Richard Mallory, David Spears, Charles Cascadden, Peter Seams, Troy Burris, Walter Gino Antonio and Charles Humphreys. For the moment, however, she would go it alone. The two detectives knew they were on a knife edge with this first interview. Even though Tyra was in a position to have been an accessory after the fact, she would not now face prosecution. However, the officers, from past experience, knew that the best laid plans often fail. If Lee changed her mind in a peak going public that Tyra was equally as responsible as she was, there would be a national uproar but they had an ace up their sleeve. Unbeknown to Lee, they knew how desperately she loved Tyra Moore. She would die for her. Nevertheless, the cops had to be on their best behaviour. They plied her with coffee and cigarettes and gave her a warm jacket to wear in the chilly office. 
with such attention linked to her need to protect her former lover, the only true love in her otherwise loveless life, and seemingly a desire to find favour with the Lord, a sentiment which she later spat upon, Lee's confession poured from her like a torrent. Bruce Munster began the interrogation. Here are excerpts from the pertinent areas. Munster What I'm going to do is I'm going to preface the tape so that there isn't any doubt about anything that's going on. I'll be straight up front with you if you'll be straight up front with me, okay? Wanos I would like to know if I wanted to. If I wanted to be straight up with one thing right here and now. Munster Sure. Wanos The reason I'm confessing is there's not another girl. There is no other girl. The girlfriend of mine is just a friend. She is working all the time, and she... She worked at the Casa del Mar. She was always working. She was not involved with any of this. And the person that was murdered... She didn't know it was... Until after the car was wrecked. See, she didn't know anything. She's really, really a good person. An honest person. A working person, and she doesn't do anything wrong. She doesn't do drugs and all that stuff. She's a real decent person that works a lot. She was my... my... roommate. Or Zeppa. Okay, so then what you're telling us is that you're voluntarily coming forward to talk to us now. Wanos. Yeah, to let you know that I'm the one that did the killings. Or Zeppa. Okay. Monster. Okay, now let me read you your rights. Okay. You have the right to remain silent. The Constitution requires that I so inform you of this right and you do not talk to me if you do not wish to do so. You do not have to answer any of my questions. Do you understand that? Wanos. Yes. Munster. If you want an attorney to be present at this time or any time hereafter, you are entitled to such counsel. If you cannot afford to pay for counsel, we will furnish you with counsel if you so desire. Do you understand that? Wanos. What does counsel mean? Munster. An attorney. At this point, Lee started to cry. Wanos. Well, what's an attorney going to do? I... I know what I did. I'm confessing what I did, and go ahead and put the electric chair to me. I should never have done it. See, most of the times I was drunk as hell and I was a professional hooker and those guys would take my offer. I'd give them a little shit sometimes, you know. And so when they started getting rough with me, I went... I just opened up and fired at them. Then I thought to myself, Why are you giving me such hell for when I just... I'm just trying to make my money and you're giving me a hassle? At this point, the interview stopped while Lee regained her composure. Wanos. I don't understand why I would have... What would an attorney do? Help me from keeping... Getting the death penalty? Munster. I don't know that. Wanos. I don't know. I don't know that either. Munster. It's your decision, Lee. I can't make it for you. Wanos. If I did get the death penalty, do they stick you in a little room all the time? Munster. I don't know. I don't know. Wanos. I'm a good person inside, but when I get drunk, I don't know what happens when somebody messes with me. When somebody hassles me, I mean, I'm like, don't fuck with me. Munster. Yeah. Wanos. I mean, anybody would be like that. And, in other words, really deep inside, I was going to... When I was a little girl, I always wanted to be a nun. And when I got older, I wanted to be a missionary. And I really got into... Then I had some back problems. Then I fell in love with somebody and I had bad... When I love somebody, I love them all the way. But what I did, I don't understand why I did it. I just don't. I don't know why they gave me hassle. I just don't know that they... 
they kind of gave me hassle. When somebody gave me hassle, I decided to whip out my gun and give it to them. Of course, I didn't really want to kill them in my heart, but I knew I had to. Because I knew if I left some witness, then they'd find out who I was, and then I'd get caught. I have to tell... I have to tell the truth. When gently pressed further, Eileen started to open up, while Monster and Horzeppa wisely kept quiet. As any first-rate interrogator knows, they have to listen to Claptrap before they get the most important issues at hand. Allow the suspect to waffle on and on before getting to the nub of the matter. A straight confession to multiple homicide. Wanus. And I just... I wanted to tell it. All I... I want to confess. I don't want my girlfriend in trouble. She doesn't deserve to go to prison nor anything because she doesn't know. She knows stuff of what I said in drunken spews, but she was not there. She did not know nothing, and she did not... You know, she didn't. She couldn't believe me. I mean, if she... If she wanted to believe me, I'm sure she couldn't hardly believe me, is what I'm saying. And she loved me. And I loved her, and she was like, I can't believe, is what I'm saying. And she was like, I can't believe me, is what I'm saying. And she loved me, and I loved her, and she was like, I can't believe you would do something like this. So... I just want her to be very, very... I'm doing this because I don't want... I love her very much, and she's so sweet and so kind and so innocent. She's just a real sweet girl, you know. You know, I don't want her to get into trouble. Because she didn't do anything. See, I was... She was at work. Casa del Mar. While I was out going... While I was going out and hooking. I would hitchhike. A guy would pick me up and I'd ask if they were interested in helping me out because I'm trying to make rent money, you know. And they'd say how much, and I'd say thirty for head, thirty-five straight, forty half and half, a hundred an hour. And there you know, then they'd say, well, I'll take this or whatever, and then, now, I'm telling you, I've dealt with a hundred thousand guys. But these guys are the only guys who gave me a problem, and they started giving me a problem just... This year, the year that went by. So I, at the time, I was staying with some guy and I noticed he had some guns and I ripped off his twenty-two, a nine-shot deal. And I carried that around while I was thumbing around. I couldn't believe the cops never searched me. I got... I got a message for the cops. You see a hitchhiker? Search them. They would never search me, and, uh, uh anyway, so when I'd get a hassle, if the person would give me my money, and I wouldn't do nothing to them. But if the person gave me my money and then started hassling me, that's when I started taking retaliation. But I was... She was at work while I'd be in Ocala or Homosassa or, or shoot, sometimes Fort Myers. I'd leave for sometimes a couple of days. It didn't happen too often. But I would, and I'd come back with a wad of money. She knew I was tricking, but she thought I was doing it decently, honestly. And I'd say I made a lot of money, because I was. Been gone for a while. She didn't know I killed somebody. See what I'm saying? And then, when she found out that I did, she left, she took off, and went back home. I told her to go home. You've got something to do? Just go and leave. Get out of my life because I don't want you involved. She didn't do anything. Yeah, she said, yeah, and she started hating me. I don't blame her. She said it's easy to hate you. It's easy to get over you. And I lost someone very dear in my life that I cared about. And I loved her with all my heart. I just wish I never would have done this shit. I wish I never would have got that gun. I wish to God I was never a hooker. And I just wish I never would have done what I did. I still have to say to myself, I still say that it was in self-defense. Because most of them are either were going to start to beat me up or were going to screw me in the ass, and as I'd get away from them, I'd run to the front of the car or jump over the seat or whatever, grab my gun and just start shooting, which they would be out of the car. 
Most of them would be nude because they took their clothes off, see. Then they didn't, you know, didn't think about running back to the car or anything. I would start shooting out. From out of the car, shoot at them. Did they find any prints on the car that was, uh, the wrecked one? Munster. Yes. Wanus. Did they find that Tyra's prints and my prints were on it? Munster. Yes. Wanus. Okay, so that's why I'm confessing. Because, see, she didn't know it was a car by a victim. She just thought I had somebody loaned it to me. And we just went around and driving around all the time and drinking and driving. And then I told her I was too drunk and I asked her if she wanted to drive and then she had a... She said okay, so she... We're driving down the road and she was going a little too fast and I told her to slow down and she couldn't control the curb, and that's when we wrecked. Then I went through the fence, got in the back of the car after it was wrecked, went through the fence, drove it down the road, while it was still smashed to hell. I had blood all over my shoulder and shit, and then I told her, I said, Listen, I'm going to tell you something. She said, What? I said, We can't let the cops know anything right now. This is a cop car. I killed somebody, Ty. She said, What? I said, I killed somebody. The officers nodded their heads in sympathetic agreement. Smiling warmly, Munster lit Lee another cigarette and passed it into Lee's trembling fingers. Lee took a long draw on the cigarette and sighed. Wanos. Even if she knew, which Ty did, most of the times I would tell her shit off the wall when I'm drunk. I think when I'm drunk I get crazy. And if I told her something, I told her, like, Okay, because remember the guy with the red car... carpet? Charles Mallory. That was found under the red carpet on 90. Uh, US 1. That was me. Okay, I told her. I said... I came home and I said... I was riding my bicycle and I stopped in the woods and I dropped it off and I found a guy under a carpet. And I told her that. She said, What? and I said I found a guy underneath the carpet. Then later on when I was really drunk and it's like truth serum or something, I told her I killed him. But I don't know if she could believe it or not. But she was pretty much like, no, you're kidding, and I was, yeah, I did. But then I don't, can't say that I really said that I really meant it because I don't remember because I'd be drunk, but I'd be telling her stuff and she didn't, wouldn't want to believe it, see? Uh, so, what I'm saying is that even though I might have said something to her, she didn't really know the truth. She's very innocent. Really, she's not. Look at Casa del Mar. Tyra Moore has name. She worked there all the damn time, all the time this stuff was happening. And when I, the last person who got hurt, she was up in Ohio. She is innocent. It was me, I can tell you blow by blow, as much as I can. Everything. I'm being as honest as I can. And she's... I told her if anybody comes to talk to you, just be as honest as you can be. Tell them that I told you or anything because you are very innocent of this stuff, and I don't want you to get into trouble because you didn't do anything. I may have told you stuff when I was drunk and everything else, but you didn't know if you believed me or not because... And she said... But I... I remember you taking a car, and we were moving our stuff. I said, I know, but remember when I told you I was borrowing it? She said, no, I don't remember that. I said, but I and but, I don't know, it's all I can say is I know that she did. She, she's innocent. That's what I'm saying. She's not partake. She did not partake in any of this. And if only thing that she would partake in anything, it would be knowing. It would be my lips saying to her something, and she didn't know if she could believe me or not, is what I'm saying. See, she was... she was very innocent. Munster. And I hope you won't lie to me, okay? Wanos. Oh, I'm telling you the truth all the way. Munster. So we can, we can sit here, we can sit here and wait till your attorney comes. We don't need to talk about the case or anything till you all come to some decision. Wanos. 
I don't care. I mean, I'm like I've been saying. I don't. I don't mind talking. I want this all. I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart. I'm telling you the truth about everything. I mean, I can't be any truthfuler. I'm telling you with God by my side. I'm telling you the truth. So don't worry. I'm telling you the truth, honest. I just got. I mean, this isn't a joke. I I didn't mean to giggle there. I'm I'm being very honest. That's all I can say. I, the only reason I'm doing this is because, number one, I'm guilty. Number two, my girlfriend is not. She doesn't didn't know anything. She was never around at the time that I hurt these people. She was at work. She'd work, eat, sleep, come home, and that was it. She's a very good person. She doesn't do drugs. She might drink a little beer now and then, but that's it. And she's a real sweet person, and she doesn't deserve to get harmed in this because she didn't do anything. And that's another reason I'm confessing, because they were looking for two women, and I want to straighten it out that she was with me with the car, but she didn't know the car belonged to somebody that was murdered, until after the wreck. And I told her, I said, "Man, Ty, I've got to tell you something, you know, in my mind." So I said. I, you know, I said, get in the bushes, man. You know, because I knew some cars were coming, and so she got in the bushes, and she said, "What, what the fuck is the deal?" I said, "I got to tell you something." And I said, "I killed somebody." She said, "What?" I said, "I killed somebody, man. This car is somebody I killed." You idiot! What are you crazy? Why did you do that? And all that stuff. So anyway, I told her we got to get out of here because I don't want you to get into trouble. You know, you you know you didn't do anything, and yeah, 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 for sure, you know, and all this stuff. So I told her to hide in the bushes every time a car went by. So finally, we started walking down the road, and then those paramedics were trying, came by the road with a fire truck, I think, and then we told them that we were hitchhiking. Two guys. I lied. I did all the talking. I said to two guys who picked us up, and we got in a wreck, and they no, no, wait, no, I didn't. I said two guys picked us up, and they dropped us off, and we're on our way to Daytona, and they told us this is where you know you can get to Daytona, and this, but it was the wrong road and all that stuff, and、um, so then I told them, you know, we got to get going. Horsepper. The only way that we can begin to talk to you again about the cases is if you wish to voluntarily come to us and say, "Look, I no longer want an attorney. I want to go ahead and talk about these things, but since you have invoked your right to an attorney, want us? Yeah, because maybe an attorney can help me because I know, or Zeppa, and we can't talk to you. Want us? Yeah, because I know that it wasn't." In my heart, I know I self-defended myself, so maybe I need an attorney. Horsepper, okay. Munster, did you contact one, Larry? Horsepper, yes. Munster, one going to come down. Horsepper, yes. Wanos, yeah, I know. I know that I have to defend myself because if I didn't, he probably would have hurt me, killed me, raped me, or whatever. Because I'm telling you, I'm serious. I've gone through at least two hundred and fifty thousand guys in my life, at least, and never hurt any of them. Matter of fact, I became very good friends with them, you know, and they really liked me. And they always wanted to see me again and stuff, but I always gave them the wrong phone number because I didn't really want to be always having calls, or I didn't have a phone anyway. So I'd give them the wrong number and stuff. So, but I mean it. I. What I'm trying to say is, I never would have hurt anybody unless I had to, and I had to at the time. So yeah, I guess I need an attorney. You know, I really suck. Munster and Horsepa were, they thought, onto a winning streak. They had manoeuvred themselves into the position of being the principal detectives when other officers were far better qualified to take the lead roles. This rankled with their colleagues, who accused them of being office seats and not good frontline investigators. During her confession to Larry Horsepa and Bruce Munster, Lee returned again and again to two themes. She wanted to make it clear that Tyra Moore was not involved in any of the murders, and she was emphatic in her assertion that nothing was her fault. 
neither the murders nor the circumstances that had shaped her life as a criminal. She claimed that all the killings were acts of self-defence. Each victim had either assaulted, threatened or raped her. Her story seemed to evolve and take on a life of its own as she related it. When she thought she had said something that might be incriminating, she would back up and retell that part, revising the details to suit her own ends. Lee claimed to have been raped several times over the years and decided it was not going to happen again. In future, when a customer became aggressive, she killed out of fear. Wanos. I'm very, very... I have to admit I'm scared about all this. I mean, I am very scared. I wouldn't have confessed if it wasn't for the fact that I don't want my girlfriend involved. I mean, I don't know because I've thought about it many times, but I don't want her involved because she's not involved. I mean, you can ask her questions and stuff, but she didn't know anything. She wasn't around, and I'm telling you. I love her very much to the max, is what I'm trying to say. I love her deep down inside very much. She's a... Well, she's not a Christian, but she goes to... She used to go to church, and she just worked, ate and slept, and watched videos at home, or watched TV. Wheel of Fortune, or Jeopardy, or whatever and movies. She never did anything else. Have pop open a few beers because she's not in. She's not guilty. And I'm willing to take the punishment because I'd rather confess that I did it so she won't have to. I, in other words, she doesn't deserve any punishment. She didn't do anything. I don't know how to express myself on this. I don't want you to think I'm doing it because I love her and am trying to protect her or something because I'm not. I'm doing it because I love her and she's not guilty. She didn't do anything. I'm being very wide, open and honest. It's a very frightening thing for me to do. But I told her. But I told her I'm a bum. I don't... She was crying her eyes out. My family's getting all messed up. She... I didn't do anything. You got me involved in all this jazz because of the car that you got wrecked. Um... You need to go and tell them that you did it and get me straightened out on this. And I said, Yes, Ty, okay, I will. And that's why I'm doing this. Because I don't need her family or her getting messed up for something that I did. Hmm. I know I'm going to miss her for the rest of my life. She's a real good person, so sweet and kind. With Lee's attorney on his way to the jail, she could not resist another long, rambling dialogue which was intended to portray Tyra Moore as a saint. Wanos. Oh, you guys, really. You can out me under hypnosis. You can take a lie detector test. Do whatever you can to make me show you that Ty does not know, did not do anything. Honestly, I am being so honest I can't be any honester than I am. She... she's just a good girl that met got messed up with a creep like me. I met her at Zodiac a long time ago. Three years of good friendship and being just... loving each other, and I screwed up the last year. I asked her, I said, If I never done this, would you have stayed with me? And she said, Yes. And so, I said, I guess you can... you can hate me now. She said, Yes. She said, it's not hard to do. I said, do you love me a little bit? She said, I guess I do feel a little bit for you, because, you know, I guess after three years you can still have a little love for me. I said, but yeah, I guess go ahead and hate me, because it'll be easier for me to get over you and you get over me. But I don't have anybody, no family or nothing. She was my only friend in the whole world, and that's why I loved her so much. But I loved because of her honesty. She never stole. My goodness, i got to tell you something. She was working at a laundromat, and she found $125 in quarters at the back of the washer. She could have kept the money, but no, she gives it to the people, gives it them back. And we were hard up for rent then. We needed rent money real bad, so I went out and made some money real quick. Then, I, when she was working as a manager at this laundromat, I said, Ty, let me see fifty cents. I'm going to get a soda. We lived three blocks from the place, she said. Hell no. She said, go home and get the money. 
I'm not going to let you use any of this money. Would you believe that they fired her, saying that she had taken some six hundred dollars? But there was another guy who was working there, and he died of cancer. And then there was another girl that was some kind of biker chick from Canada that would take over, um, little, you know, for an hour or two. And I think they're the ones that stole the money. And she got fired for that, and she did not take it. Because, honey, I... I mean, I'm... I'm thinking of her, and when I talk to her... I'd be with her all the time, and we needed rent money. I had to go out and hustle for it. There's no way she took it. You see what I'm saying? She's a very honest person. I guess because we are lesbians, they'd always mess with us. She got fired at the Casa del Mar because we are lesbians. I know that's what the reason is. He's from Iran, and, yeah, he didn't like the idea that he wouldn't... He couldn't get a piece of ass from her. Kept trying to get a piece of ass from all the girls at work. Yeah, he's the boss, you know. And so finally he said, Well, I knew it was coming to fire you. And she wouldn't give, you know, she's not going to... She's real sweet and innocent. She ain't going to. God, she's in love with me, you know what I'm saying? We didn't even have sex, hardly. We'd had sex, I'd say, the first year, maybe three times, and the next years we didn't even have sex together. We were just friends, just good friends. Hugging, kissing. But we were good friends, you know? So that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm confessing, because she's... Shit, she wouldn't deserve anything, because she didn't do anything, you know? I don't want her in trouble for something that I honestly did. I know right now it's easy for me to confess. I know right now it's easy for me to say everything honestly now, when I get back to the cell... I'll probably cry my eyes out. I'll go through a lot of hell, through court and everything else. I'll take a major toll in this. I understand. So I know it's very frightening for me to confess. Because I know I'm probably looking at death. I'm possibly looking at life imprisonment. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I know one thing. I just want to get right with God again and give this. I'll put my trust with the Lord and with the people here so everybody knows. I am so sorry. I mean, I... I realise I don't have a family, so I don't... Sorry. Lee paused. Tears were now streaming down her face. Wanos. I mean, I... I realise I don't have a family, so I don't understand. But when I... After I'm seeing Ty's family and everything. I have never met the family, but noticing how Ty was on the phone and stuff, I realise now how badly I used to hurt some families. And the re- Now, I- These- These were older men. Another thing after they were dead that didn't bother me because I thought, well, they're older. They probably don't have anybody hardly anyway, so it didn't worry me too much but I didn't kill them for that reason. I killed them because they tried to do something to me. But I think that, well, they're old. Their father and mother's probably deceased, and so why worry about it and stuff? I don't know. Creaky spots in my head, I guess. More sobs. I wish to God. I wish I hadn't done it. Not that I'm feeling sorry for myself for what I'm going to play. I'm saying I wish I never had the gun. I wish I never, ever hooked, and I wish I never would have met those guys. Because I wouldn't have had to do what I did if I hadn't been hooking, see? It's because of hustling and the guy's going to physically harm me that I have to harm him back. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, because if I wasn't hustling, if I wasn't hooking around, I would have never had a physical problem, and I would never have had to hurt anybody. And I do have to say one thing. Their families must realise that no matter how much they loved the people that died... No matter how much they loved them, they were bad people because they were going to hurt me. So they have to realise the fact that this person, no matter how much they loved them or how good they felt they were, this person was either going to physically beat me up, rape me or kill me. And I don't know which one. And I just turned around and did my fair play before I would get hurt. See? So I would love to say to the families, I mean... That guy's going, you stupid bitch, you killed my husband, or whatever, you know? Or my brother, or something. And I just have to say to them, 
Listen, what are they going to do to me? I would be probably turning around if I survived it and say, You stupid bastards. You almost killed me. You almost raped me. You almost beat the shit out of me. So you know that's how I have to look at it. I have to look at it like that too. So I can't really say that they were sweet. You know, I know that these guys... One guy had a weapon with him. He had a forty-five, and I... It was dark, and he didn't know where he put it. This is the weapon that I sold. And, um, I don't know where he put it. But I didn't know he had a weapon, see? I had no idea he had a weapon, but when he started shitting on me, that's when I grabbed my gun and I started shooting. And when I was done shooting him, and I went through the car, and there was the forty-five sitting on top of the hood, I think he was going to take the gun and blow my brains out. So that's another case, and that's, honestly, you have to say, if you're hooking, don't do it. I mean, I could help people out so bad, because I think I have six ch I had six times I almost got killed. And I killed the person, see? And I'm being very honest. Now to recollect all this stuff is going to be hard. Because a lot of times I was drunk, and after I'd done it, you know, I'd go and get drunk. So, wow, to remember everything is going to be a little bit difficult. I don't even know their names. I can't even remember their names. After a break for coffee and cigarettes, Lee was introduced to Michael O'Neill, the attorney from the Volusia County Public Defender's Office. Now the police could continue in earnest. On numerous occasions, O'Neill advised her to stop talking, finally asking in exasperation, Do you realize these guys are cops? Lee answered, I know, and they want to hang me, and that's cool because maybe, man, I deserve it. I just want to get this over with. Or Zeppa. How many men have you actually shot and murdered? Shot and killed? Monos. Six. All I can remember. Or Zeppa. Six. Six men that you remember. Monster. You forgot about the one. Inaudible. That makes seven. Wanos. No, because I only did six. Or Zeppa. Okay. Monster. Well, we'll go over those six first. Wanos. Right, I think there's only six. Or Zeppa. Okay. Wanos. I know. I think it's six. Or Zeppa. Okay, well, we'll go ahead now. Wanos. Okay, yeah, because because if you showed me all the pictures of the guys, I can tell you. And if you show me a picture of a guy that, you know, if there's a seventh guy, I can tell you if I did or not, because I'm being very honest with you, as much as possible. I mean, I am telling you the absolute honest to God, so help me, Lord, strike me with lightning in my heart right now, if I'm not telling you the truth. Lee then went on to ramble for two minutes about how innocent Tyra was and what a sweet, young, innocent thing she had been while Lee had been out killing men. Then she was stopped short and asked when she aimed her shots. Wanos. I think I probably... It was... I always shot somebody if I could, you know, as fast as I could. It would always hit right around this area. She indicated to the centre of her chest. Up here, right over. I always aim to the midsection, so I know I shot them. Usually it would be we both got naked and I was going to do an honest deed, but I had a big fight. They, they were either going to physically fight me, either try to rape me or something, or they were going to try to, you know, so they wouldn't have to pay their... I don't know what they were going to do. They just started getting radical on me and I had to do what I had to do. Bruce Munster and Lawrence Horzeppa had heard all this soul-washing before from Lee. Now, with her lawyer present, they wanted to get down to business. The time for delicate niceties was over. Munster. Okay, the guy with the forty-five that you told me about before, Charles Cascadden. Now, is he before this or after this, do you remember? Warnos. 
I think he was before. He was the second guy. Munster. Oh, the guy with the Cadillac was the second guy. Juanus. No, the guy with the forty-five. I shot more than over nine times. Because I was pissed when I found the forty-five on top of the car. I reloaded the gun, and I shot him some more. And we were way out in the boonies there, and that's where he started getting physical. He said, you fucking bitch, and I said, you fucking bastard, you were going to blow my brains out, and I kept shooting him in the back seat of the car. Then I drove over to 52 and dumped the body. Munster. Was he still naked? Juanos. He was naked. I always stripped first. Mallory never stripped. He was going to physically fight me and get whatever he wanted. I don't know, without his pants off, but it was his trip. Lee went on to explain how Mallory picked her up. Juanos. All right, he asked me if I wanted to smoke a joint, and I said, well, I don't really smoke pot, and he said, you don't mind if I smoke some. I said, I don't care what you do, do whatever you feel like doing, it doesn't bother me. So he's smoking pot, and we're going down the road, and he says, do you want a drink? And he has, I don't know what it was, it was tonic and some jazz. I don't know what kind of liquor it was. So I said, sure, that sounds good to me. So we're drinking, and we're getting past Orlando, and we're getting pretty drunk now, and we're continually going down the road, and I... we're getting drunk royal. Then I asked him if he wanted to help me make some money, because I need some money for rent and everything. He was interested at the time. So we go out and we stop at this place on US-1, but we spend the whole night drinking and, you know, having fun for a little while. Hall Zepper. What's having fun? Juanos. Like, just talking. He's smoking pot, and I'm drinking, and we're talking. Then he said, Okay, do you want to make your money now? Around probably five in the morning, maybe. And I said, Okay. You know, so he's pretty drunk, and I'm pretty drunk. Or Zeppa. Now describe this area where you're at. Juanos. We're past I-95, maybe a half mile up the road. There was a little spot that went into the woods. Or Zeppa. And you're off which road? Wanos. US-1. Or Zeppa. US-1. Okay. Describe to me the spot in the woods if you can. Was it small, large? Do you remember anything about it? Wanos. Well, it was dark. We couldn't hardly see to get in. Or Zeppa. How'd you find it? Wanos. We kind of drove looking for this road to go in, and we drove back around and we saw a road go in. Or Zeppa. Okay, so you were looking for a cut-off in the woods. Wanos. Right. Or Zeppa. A spot in the woods, that was. Wanos. Right. Or Zeppa. Already a trail? Wanos. Right. Or Zeppa. Okay. Wanos. So we go into the woods, so he gives me the money and I start to disrobe. Now the guy's getting really... kind of starting. Now he's going to start getting, you know, kissing on me and stuff, and... Anyway, he hasn't disrobed himself at all. Or Zeppa, do you know what he was wearing? Juanos, I think he was wearing jeans and some shirt. Or Zeppa, do you remember if it was long or short sleeves? Juanos. No, I don't remember at all. Or Zeppa. Okay. Juanos. Okay, so anyway, we're in the front seat. He's hugging and kissing on me and all this shit, so then he starts, you know, pushing me down, and I said, Wait a minute, you know, get cool. You don't have to get rough, you know. This is, let's have fun. This is for fun, you know. And he's telling me, well, baby, you know, I've been waiting for this all night long, and stuff like that. Or Zeppa. Now, where are you when this is occurring? Wanos. In the front seat of the car. Or Zeppa. All right, and you're sitting where? Wanos. On the passenger side. Or Zeppa. And he is sitting where? Wanos. In the driver's seat, going against me. Or Zeppa. 
Okay, he's behind the wheel of the car. Juanos. But he's coming toward me. Paul Zeppa. Okay. Juanos. The doors are open. Okay, so then he's getting really heavy, you know, on me, you know, and stuff. And I'm going like, now he's getting to where he just wants to just, you know, unzip his pants, not take his pants off or anything, just start having sex and stuff. And I said, well, why don't you just disrobe or something, you know, I mean, why do you have to have your clothes still on? Then he started getting violent with me. So we're fighting a little bit, and I had my purse right on the passenger floor. Poor Zeppa. What kind of purse did you have? Juanos. A, a brown purse. Poor Zeppa. Is that the same purse that you... Juanos. Oh no, wait, I didn't have my brown purse. No, it's not the one I had. I had a blue bag and it had a zip on the side. Okay, and it was unzipped because I, I wanted to make sure if anything happened... I, I could use my gun. Things are starting to happen where he was going to... I was thinking he was going to roll me, take my money back, beat me up, or whatever the heck he was going to do. So I jumped out of the car with my bag and I grabbed the gun and I said, Get out of the car. And he said, What? What's going on? And I said, You son of a bitch, I knew you were going to rape me. And he said, No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. And I said, oh yes you were, you know you were going to try and rape me, man. So anyway, I told him to step away from the car. Oh no, 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 I didn't. All this and another thing. Okay, I know what happened. Okay, I took, I got, I jumped out of the car. Yeah, he was starting to physically do stuff to me. Oh, this is a different story. God, see, it's so long ago. Or Zappa. It's all right, take your time. Wanos. Yeah. Okay, I jumped out of the car. I, I pulled my gun out when he started to physically do shit with me. Or Zeppa. Now, what type of gun did you have? Wanos. Nine... Point two two nine shot, you know. Or Zeppa. Twenty-two long rifle? Wanos. No, it's a gun, like about this big. Or Zeppa. Okay, why did you keep that gun with you? Juanos. I was keeping it for protection. Or Zeppa. Where did you get the gun from? Juanos. I stole it from a guy at a house. Or Zeppa. How long before? Juanos. Oh God, I don't know. I think it was... Or Zeppa. Months? Years? Juanos. I don't know, man. It might have been a, about a couple of months ago. I might have got the gun just then. I, I don't... I can't remember. Like two days... Like... Like two days before or something? Or Zeppa. Okay, that's no problem. Juanos. Because I can't remember. It's such a long time. I did a lot of stuff in the time, you know. Or Zeppa. Okay, so you're back there. You jump out of the car. Juanos. I jumped out of the car because he was physically starting to abuse me, and I remember now he didn't even give me any money. This was another guy. This guy, he said, Well, I'll give... No, I said. Well, I always take my money first, and he said he wanted to see how the merchandise fit. Or Zeppa. This is what Mr. Mallory told you. Juanos. Yes. Or Zeppa. Okay. Juanos. So I said, well, since I've been talking to you all night long, I think you seem like a pretty nice guy, you know. So, okay, let's, let's go have fun. So I started to lay down, and he was going to, you know, unzip his pants. And I said, why don't you take your clothes off? My God, you know, I said, well, it hurt to do that. Then he got pissed, calling me... He said, fuck you, baby, I'm going to screw you right here and now. Something like that. Or Zeppa. Now where are you? Juanos. I'm in the woods with this guy and the doors are open. Or Zeppa. Okay. Juanos. 
I remember that, and I said, No, no, you're not going to just fuck me. You've got to pay me. And he said, Oh, bullshit. And that's when he got pissed. Now I'm coming back to recollection, okay? So that's when we started fighting and everything else, and I jumped out. He grabbed my bag, and I grabbed my bag, and the arm busted, and when I got the bag again and I pulled it out of his hand, that's when I grabbed the pistol out. And when I grabbed the pistol out, I just shot him in the front seat. Referring to Richard Mallory later in the questioning, Lee changed the earlier version of her account and claimed, See, one guy, he was trying to screw me in the ass and stuff. He, he was going to try to anal screw, you know, and screw, or whatever you call it. So I started fighting with him and I got my bag and I shot him. And then when I shot him the first time, he just backed away and I thought, I thought to myself, well, hell, should I, you know, try to help this guy or should I just kill him? So I didn't know what to do. So I figured, well, if I help the guy and he lives, he's going to tell on me and I'm going to get it for attempted murder, all this jazz. And I thought, well, the best thing to do is just keep shooting him. Then I get to the point that I thought, well, I shot him. The stupid bastard would have killed me, so I kept shooting. You know, in other words, I shot him, and then I said to myself, Damn, you know, if I didn't sh shoot him, he would have shot me, because he would have beat the shit out of me, maybe. I would have been unconscious. He would have found my gun going through my stuff and shot me. Because he probably would have gone to get it for trying to rape me, see? So I shot him, and then I thought to myself, well, hell, I might as well just keep shooting him. Because I got to kill the guy, because he's going, he's going to, you know, go and, and tell somebody if he lives, whatever. Then I thought to myself, well, this dirty bastard deserves to die anyway because of what he was trying to do to me. So those three things went in my mind for every guy that I shot. Munster. Did you watch TV? Wanos. I watched TV all my life. Munster. Did you watch to see if the police... Wanus. I watched TV all the time, but after the crimes, yes, I did. Munster. To see what the police were doing? Wanus. To see if they had found the bodies. Or Zeppa. Okay, from all the shootings that you have told us about, for the most part you've always gotten the drop on these guys. You've been able to get your gun and point it at them. Wanus. Uh-huh. Or Zeppa. Right? Wanus. Right. Or Zeppa. Okay, at that particular time you were in control. Why didn't you just run? Why didn't you... Wanus. Because I was always basically totally nude with my shoes off and everything, and I wasn't going to run through the woods and briars and the... Or Zeppa. No, but still, like I say, you're in control. You got that gun. You could go ahead and get dressed while you had, you know, them do whatever you basically wanted. Why did you go ahead and shoot these people, Wanus? Because they physically fought with me, and I was, well, I guess I was afraid, because they were physically fighting with me, and what am I supposed to do? You know, hold the gun there until I get dressed, and now I'm going to walk out of there. When the guy, you know, might you know, run me over with his truck, or might come back when I'm walking through the woods or something. Um, have a gun on him too or something. I didn't know if they had a gun or not. Or Zeppa. So was it, was it your intent during each of these crimes to kill this person so they couldn't come back at you later? Wanos. Because I didn't know if they had a gun or anything. I, once I got my gun, I was like, Hey man, I've got to shoot you because I think you're going to kill me, see? Or Zeppa. So, was it was it your intent, during each of these crimes, to kill this person so they couldn't come back at you later? Wanus. Because I didn't know if they had a gun or anything. I, once I got my gun, I was like, Hey man, I've got to shoot you because I think you're going to kill me, see? Or Zeppa. What about the ones who didn't have a gun, like Mr. Mallory? Wanus. I didn't know they had, didn't have a gun. Or Zeppa. Okay, so you were taking no chances. Wanus. Right. I did not know what had they, what was in their vehicle, see? Or Zeppa. Okay. 
Juanos. I didn't know if they had it under the seat, close by them. I didn't know if they were in arm's reach of another weapon or what, see? Horzepa. What made you take property? A lot of property, or a little property, from some and not from others. Was there anything there that... Juanos. I guess it was. Horzepa motivated you to... Juanos. I guess it was after... it was... Pure hatred. Yeah, I think afterward it was like, you bastard, you would have hurt me, and uh, I'll take the stuff and get my money's worth, because some of them didn't even hardly have any money. They were going to... they were... some of them didn't have any money. Like that guy, um, the drug dealer guy. He had twenty bucks, and he was... he wasn't going to give me any more money. The one with the forty-five on the hood. Karskadden. Or Zeppa. Hmm. Hmm. So, you just started living off the items that they had. Is that what you were doing? Wanus. No, I think I took them just for the fact that, you bastards, you were going to hurt me, you were going to rape me, or whatever you were going to do. Well, I'll just, you know, keep these little items so I don't have to buy them or something. I don't know. I just... Or Zeppa. It was like Final Revenge. Wanus. Yeah, okay, that would... that would do. Hmm. Hmm. Munster. Lee, after you shot one time, I mean, you could have left. You could have taken their stuff and... Inaudible. Wanus. I didn't want to do that because I was afraid that if I shot them one time and they survived... My, fa my face and all that description of me would be all over the place, and the only way I could make money was to hustle. And I knew these guys would, probably would, you know, rat on me if they survived and all this stuff. And I would... I was hoping that I, after what I had to do, that I wouldn't have gotten caught for it because I figured that these guys deserved it. Because those guys were going to either rape, kill... I don't know what they were going to do to me. See what I'm saying? Or Zeppa. So you continued to kill these men to cover up when you... when you shot these men. Mallory was the first, is that correct? Munster. Okay, you continued. You had to go ahead and kill these men so that they couldn't testify against you and have it all backtracked. From body to body, then. Wanus. Oh, no, I didn't even think of that, either. I, I shot them because it was like, to me, a self-defending thing, because I felt that if I didn't shoot them and I didn't kill them, first of all, if they survived, my ass would be getting in trouble for attempted murder. So I'm up Shit's Creek on that one anyway, and... And if I didn't, and if... And if I didn't kill them, you know, of course, I mean, I had to kill them, or it's retaliation, too. It's like, you bastards, you were going to... you were going to hurt me. Or Zeppo. So now I'm going to hurt you. Wanos. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Munster. Yeah, all, all these guys that you shot, they seem to be older guys, over the age of forty. What is that? Wanos. Because all of the guys that I dealt with were that age. Every... every guy. Munster. You were dead wood for the younger guys? Wanos. No, every guy I dealt with on the road was anywhere from, let's see, thirty-seven and up. Or Zeppa. Was that your decision? I mean, like the... Wanus. Yeah, because I... Or Zeppa. Younger guy in his twenties would stop. Wanus. Yeah, because, see, I don't do drugs or anything, and I wanted to deal with people who didn't do drugs. I was looking for clean and decent people. But, like I say, it just happened that the last... this following year that I kept meeting guys that were turning out to be ugly guys, to me, that they were... fighting. For three hours Lee talked and talked. Then she talked some more, despite the continuing advice from her attorney, who effectively spelled it out to his client that she was putting her head in a noose. Lee's mitigation was that she had been the wronged person. A simple hooker trying to earn a fast buck. Her victims had used her, treated her badly or tried to have sex without payment. Her only remorse appeared to be directed towards Tyra, the lover she had failed. 
she shed not a tear for the incalculable suffering she had caused to her victims and their next of kin. She wanted to make it good with God before she died. This would change as the months passed inexorably by during which Eileen Warnus would metamorphose into the true monster that she really was. But for now, with attentive, seemingly understanding police officers hanging on her every word, Lee continued to spill the beans. Larry Horzeppa now turned his attention to the property Lee had stolen from her dead victims. Horzeppa, is there any property that you would have collected from these victims that may be stashed somewhere? You might have put it in the woods or behind an abandoned house or anything like that. Warnus, no, uh-uh. I just flung them out the window as I'm driving, or stopped and threw them and stuff like that. I couldn't even tell you where, because they were way out in the country somewhere where I didn't even know, sometimes where I was. Or Zeppa. There's something I forgot to ask you. There's another guy that's missing that we haven't found. A guy that worked for the Kennedy Space Center. A guy that worked for the Kennedy Space Center, and there was a white Oldsmobile, and the car was parked in Orange County, off Samoran and 436. The guy had glasses on, and this would have been right around the HRS guy's car. Charles Humphreys. Wanus. Um. Monster. It was a white car, and he was driving from Titusville to Atlanta. It was a white two-door car. Wanus. No, I don't recall anything like that. Munster. Do you have a picture of him, Larry? Wanus. Yeah, yeah, if you've got a picture of him... Poor Zeppa. What was the name on that? Munster. Reed. Curtis Reed. Warnus. Curtis Reed. I don't know that one. I don't remember anybody like that. Munster. He worked at the Kennedy Space Center, and he had a Space Center emblem on his windshield of his rear window, and someone scraped it off. He had a lot of money. He just cashed his paycheck. You might have had... Warnus. I never got anybody that had a lot of money. Munster. He might have had a thousand dollars, something like that. Warnus. Oh, I never got anything like that. Uh-uh. Or Zeppa. No, I have a flyer of the emblem. I don't have that one. Warnus. I don't recall anything like that, because I never... I never got a lot of money on it. The only money I got the most was that one that I didn't know was a missionary dude was like four hundred dollars, Peter seems. Having settled this matter, Bruce Munster started asking about the various alibis Lee had used. Munster. Who's Susan Blahovec? Wanus. Oh, well, that's another fake ID I had. Munster. How'd you get that one? Wanus. Oh, Lord, let's see, how did I get it? Oh, um... This guy in the Keys had a birth certificate, and he told me to use it for... because I had a suspended driver's license, and he told me I could use that ID. Oh, because... and I had... I think I had a... forgery warrant, was at that time? I think I had that on me. And he told me I could use this ID, that it was his wife's ID, that she had never... he hated his wife big time. And that I could... she's never been in trouble, and that I could turn that birth certificate and license. But... You don't get into trouble with it, you know, just use it for driving and stuff. So I did. Munster. All right, I think that's... Warnus. How in the world did you find out about Susan Blahovich now? Munster. Oh, Warnus. And did I put my name on a motel, is that or something? Munster. No, you got some tickets with it. Warnus. Oh, okay, I remember that, all right. Munster. I know about the time in 1974 you were arrested under the name of Sandra Beatrice Kretsch. Warnus. Yeah. Munster. Your neighbour? Warnus. Yeah, I was... I was young, and she was 33 or something, and the judge couldn't... I spent ten days in jail for that one. She got away with having to go to jail on her damn ticket. Munster. How far did you go in high school? Warnus. Tenth and a half grade. Munster. Why do you quit? Warnus. Because my mother died and my father wouldn't let me stay at home, and I was living out on the street. I just want... 
to know that I hope to God that you guys do understand that Ty is not involved with this. She doesn't know. She thought that I had these cars rented or, or borrowed them and all this jazz. And she wasn't too... too aware of what I was doing. I mean, she didn't know exactly what was happening. I mean, I, when I'd get drunk, I'd say shit from the top of my head just to try to be a badass because I was drunk. And... but she didn't have anything to do with these murders. She didn't have anything to do with anything. She just worked, ate, slept, stayed at home, went to volleyball practice and was just a good gal. I've dealt with a hundred thousand guys, but these guys are the only guys that gave me a problem and they started giving me a problem just this year, the year that went by. So I, at the same time I was staying with some guy and I noticed that he had some guns and I ripped off his twenty-two, a nine-shot deal. So when I get hassle the person gave me my money and then started hassling me, that's when I started taking retaliation. I just wish I never would have done this shit. And I just wish I never would have done what I did. I still have to say to myself, I still say that it was in self-defense. Really, inside, right inside me, I'm a good person. But when I get drunk, like I said, I'd be drinking with these guys and when they started messing with me, I wouldn't... I would never hurt nobody. But if they messed with me, then I would. I'd just... I have to say I was... I'd get just as violent as they would get on me to try and protect myself. Munster. I know what I wanted to ask you. You said that you put a gun and a flashlight, some handcuffs, into the water. Monus. Oh, yeah. Munster. Over by the bridge around Fairview. Now you walked to the... on the bridge there, were you in the middle or towards one side or the other? Wanos. Oh, when you go over the bridge... Munster. Uh-huh. Wanos. There's the other little bank there. Munster. Uh-huh. Wanos. And it's right underneath the bridge there. Munster. Okay. Poor Zeppa. Is it actually in the water or did you hide it up underneath the bridge? Wanos. No, it's... it's in the water. Munster. Okay, you took the gun and threw it underneath there? Wanos. Yes. Munster. Now, did you throw the handcuffs someplace else? Wanos. No, I just dropped them along. They're straight down, yeah. Munster. All right. Poor Zeppa. Could you see them when they hit, hit the bottom of the... Wanos. No, but I know it's waist deep around there, because some guy said he had cemented that part out there. And he had to get his net untangled from the crab trap, and he told me it's about anywhere from here to there in the water. Or Zeppa. Lee, would you be willing, if we needed you to, uh, go out with us to try to locate that twenty-two that you threw into the water? If you can show us the exact location where you had tossed it, would you be willing to do that for us, Lee? Wanos. I'm willing to do anything. I want to just let you know I'm the only one involved in this deal. Stuff. Shit. Or Zeppa. Also, to um, later on, would you be willing to talk to other investigators? Wanos. Oh, no problem. Or Zeppa. If needed, from the other counties that have cases involved. Wanos. I want all this out in the open, and I want them to know that there's not two girls. Ty is as innocent as can be. There was only one person. It was me, because I'm a hooker, and I got involved with these guys because they were phys... And it was a physical sit... Because I'm telling you now, I'm serious. Every day when I was hitchhiking, I would meet anywhere from five to eight guys a day and make... Now, but some would say no and some would say yes. Monster. Hmm. Hmm. Wanos. And I would make money, but they wouldn't abuse me or nothing. I'd just do my thing and make my money. Stick it in my wallet and go. Monster. Okay, that about wraps it up. All right, now I'm going to turn the tape off, and it is 2.21 in the afternoon. Wanos. Can I ask you something? Munster. You certainly can. Wanos. Do you mind if I keep these cigarettes, because I don't have any cigarettes at all? You are quite welcome to them, and I'm glad you didn't ask to keep my jacket. Wanos. Oh, yeah, that was warm. Thank you. Poor Zeppa. Sure, no problem. Wanos. I'm very sorry. 
after getting the most pressing and somewhat self-serving issues off her chest, resiliently settled down to jail life, her mood alternating between abject depression and joviality. She had been allowed newspapers, and she avidly pored over the notoriety she was now receiving from the world's media. Her emotions, which had originally centred around Tyra, started to take a back seat. Religion and turning to God was way back in the past. She was becoming a celebrity, a person of some import, and for the first time in her life she felt she had at least achieved something of value. If she could beat the rap, and she was sure she could convince everyone that she had only killed in self-defence, she could make a mint and buy a decent attorney and her way to freedom. The true nature of Lee's psychopathic personality was about to be unleashed. Not this time in a car with a vulnerable man at some lonely place, but in a more insidious way in the county jail, where she was observed by corrections officer Susan Hansen. Two days after Lee's interviews with police, Susan Hansen was on duty and assigned to keep an eye on Lee. Although this inmate was not supposed to be treated any differently to other prisoners, a certain mystique had built up around the so-called mystery guest. Everyone was curious, and everybody wanted a piece of the action that was focused on Lee Wanos. As cocky as one would like, Lee saw Officer Hansen peering through the glass panel of her cell, and said, "'Listen to this. They say here, in the newspaper, "'This woman is a killer who robs, not a robber who kills.' "'That's... sure, I shot them, but it was self-defence.' Later, in her deposition, Hansen recalled that Lee said that she had been raped many times and I just got sick of it. If I didn't kill those guys, I would have been raped a total of twenty times, maybe. If I didn't kill those guys, I would have been raped a total of twenty times, maybe. Or killed. You never know. But I got them first. I figured that at least I was doing some good killing these guys, because if I didn't kill them, they would have hurt someone else. Officer Hansen took in every word, but said very little in return. Her instructions were to listen and document as much as she could remember as soon as it was possible to get to her notepad. "'I shouldn't be telling you any of this,' continued Lee. "'But get this. I had these two guys say they were cops, or at least they flashed their badges at me. They picked me up and wanted sex but didn't want to pay. Said if I didn't they'd turn me in. One grabbed my hair and pushed me towards his penis. We really started fighting then, so I killed them. Afterwards I looked at their badges, and one was a reservist cop or something, Walter Gino Antonio was a Brevard County Reserve Deputy, and the other worked for, like, the HRS. Charles Humphreys was the supervisor for the Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services, referred to as the HRS. I had lots of guys, maybe ten to twelve a day, boasted Lee. I could have killed all of them, but I didn't want to. I'm really just a nice person. I'm describing a normal day to you here, but a killing day would be about the same. On a normal day we would just do it by the side of the road if they wanted oral sex, or behind a building or maybe just off the road in the woods if they wanted it all. On a killing day those guys always wanted to go way, way back in the woods. Now I know why they did it. They're going to hurt me. I figured if these guys lived and I got fried for attempted murder, I thought, fuck it, I might as well get fried for murder instead. In her deposition, Officer Hansen said she was laughing a lot when she talked to me. When she would talk about specifically how she shot the guy, the one guy with the forty-five, she just stood there. She was very... Sometimes she would laugh. Sometimes she was calm in explaining this. Other times she would just get very excited. She was never sad in any way. Never once did she say... I'm upset about this. She just said, If I hadn't killed him, he'd kill other people. The jailhouse medic also witnessed Lee's cheerful mood when he stopped by to give her some medication to calm her nerves. I never really saw her down, he said. She was always jovial and boasted of having done 250,000 men in the past nine years. We kind of looked at her a little strange for that, said Officer Hansen. The doctor just kind of walked away after that, and she sat down and began reading the papers again. News that the police had secured a female serial killer's confession soon leaked out to the public domain, 
and an avalanche of book and movie deals poured in to detectives, to Lee and Tyra, and to the victim's relatives. Lee seemed to think she would make millions of dollars from her story, not yet realizing that Florida had a law against criminals profiting in such a manner. She commanded headlines in the local and national media. She felt famous and continued to talk about the crimes with anyone who would listen, including Volusia County Jail employees. With each retelling, she refined her story a little further, seeking to cast herself in a better light each time. On Monday, the 28th of January, 1991, Lee Wanos was indicted for the murder of Richard Mallory. The indictment read, In that Eileen Carol Wanos, a.k.a. Susan Lynn Blahovich, a.k.a. Laurie Christine Grody, a.k.a. Cammie Marsh Green, on or about the first day of December 1989, within Volusia County, did then and there unlawfully, from a premeditated design to effect the death of one Richard Mallory, a human being, while engaged in the perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate robbery, did kill and murder Richard Mallory by shooting him with a firearm, to wit, a handgun. Counts two and three charged her with armed robbery and possession of a firearm, and, by late February, she had been charged with the murders of David Spears in Citrus County and Charles Humphreys and Troy Burris in Marion County. Lee's attorneys engineered a plea bargain whereby she would plead guilty to six charges and receive six consecutive life terms. One state's attorney, however, thought she should receive the death penalty, so on Monday, the 14th of January, 1992, she went to trial for the murder of Richard Mallory. The evidence and testimony of witnesses were severely damaging. Dr. Arthur Botting, the medical examiner who had carried out the autopsy on Mallory's body, stated that he had taken between ten and twenty agonizing minutes to die. Tyra testified that Lee had not seemed overly upset, nervous, or drunk when she told her about the Mallory killing. Twelve men went on to the witness stand to testify to their encounters with Lee along Florida's highways and byways over the years. Florida has a law known as the Williams Rule, which allows evidence, relating to other crimes, to be admitted if it serves to show a pattern. Because of the Williams Rule, information regarding other killings alleged to have been committed by Lee was presented to the jury. Her claim of having killed in self-defence would have been a lot more believable had the jury only known of Mallory. Now, with the jury made aware of all the murders, self-defence seemed the least plausible explanation. After the excerpts from her videotaped confession were played, the self-defence claim simply looked ridiculous. Lee seemed not the least upset by the story she was telling. She made easy conversation with her interrogators, and repeatedly told her attorney to be quiet. Her image on the screen allowed her to condemn herself out of her own mouth. I took a life. I am willing to give up my life because I killed people. I deserve to die, she said. Tricia Jenkins, one of Lee's public defenders, did not want her client to testify and told her so. But Lee overrode this advice, insisting on telling her story. By now, her account of Mallory's murder barely resembled the one she gave in her confession. Mallory had raped, sodomized, and tortured her, she claimed. On cross-examination, Prosecutor John Tanner obliterated any shred of credibility she may have had. As he brought to light all her lies and inconsistencies, she became agitated and angry. Her attorneys repeatedly advised her not to answer questions, and she invoked her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination twenty-five times. She was the defence's only witness, and when she left the stand there was not much doubt about how her trial would end. Judge Uriel Bunky Blount, Jr. charged the jury on Monday, the 27th of January. They returned their verdict ninety-one minutes later. Pamela Mills, a schoolteacher, had been elected foreperson, and she presented the verdict to the bailiff. He, in turn, handed it to the judge. The judge read it and passed it to the clerk, who spoke the words that sealed Lee's fate. We, the jury, find Eileen Wanos guilty of premeditated felony murder in the first degree, she told an expectant assembly in the courtroom. As the jury filed out, their duty done, 
Lee exploded with rage, shouting, I'm innocent. I was raped. I hope you get raped, scumbags of America. Her outburst was still fresh in the minds of jurors as the penalty phase of her trial began the next day. Expert witnesses for the defense testified that Lee was mentally ill, that she suffered from a borderline personality disorder, and that her tumultuous upbringing had stunted and ruined her. Jenkins referred to her client as a damaged primitive child, as she tearfully pleaded with the jury to spare Lee's life. But the jurors neither forgot nor forgave the woman they had come to know during the trial. With a unanimous verdict, they recommended that Judge Blount's sentence her to die in the electric chair. He confirmed the sentence on Friday, the 31st of January, first quoting his duty from a printed text. Eileen Carol Wanos, being brought before the court by her attorneys William Miller, Tricia Jenkins and Billy Nolas, having been tried and found guilty of count one, first degree premeditated murder and first degree felony murder of Richard Mallory, a capital felony, and count two, armed robbery with a firearm, hereby judged and found guilty of said offences, and the court having given the defendant an opportunity to be heard and to offer matters in mitigation of sentence. It is the sentence of this court that you, Eileen Carol Wanos, be delivered by the Sheriff of Volusia County to the proper officer of the Department of Corrections of the State of Florida, and by him safely kept, until by warrant of the Governor of the State of Florida, you, Eileen Wanos, be electrocuted until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your corpse. A collective gasp arose from the courtroom, diminishing the solemnity of the occasion. The sense of shock was less to do with the judge's sentiment than his choice of words. May God have mercy on your corpse. Did Judge Blount really say that? Corpse. Members of the media stopped with pencils poised in mid-air. He had got it wrong. Surely he should have said, May God have mercy on your soul. Could they quote him? They whispered among themselves. Eileen Wanos did not stand trial again. On Tuesday, the 31st of March, 1992, she pleaded no contest to the murders of Dick Humphreys, Troy Burris, and David Spears, saying that she wanted to get it right with God. After a rambling statement to the court, she concluded, I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me, as I've told you but these others did not. They only began to start to. She ended her monologue by turning to Assistant State's Attorney Rick Ridgway and hissing, I hope your wife and children get raped in the ass. On Friday the 15th of May, Judge Thomas Sawyer handed her three more death sentences. She made an obscene gesture and muttered, Motherfucker. For a time, there was speculation that Wanos might receive a new trial for the murder of Richard Mallory. New evidence uncovered by the defense, not presented to the jury at her trial, showed that Mallory had spent ten years in prison for sexual violence, and attorneys felt that jurors would have seen the case differently had they been aware of this. No new trial was forthcoming, though, and the state Supreme Court of Florida affirmed all six of her death sentences. <laughs> 